for tapes of end time meetings, deliverance services, or Lake Hamilton Bible Campgrounds publication, Voices from His Excellent Glory, Declaring the Kingdom, writes Post Office Box 21516, Hot Springs National Park, Arkansas, zip 71903. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are many hundreds of free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Thursday evening, May the 21st, 1981. Lake Hamilton Bible Camp Memorial Weekend Deliverance Seminar with George Leroy of Toronto, Canada. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Father. We bow in thy holy presence. We thank thee for the moving of your spirit. We thank thee, Father, that you're with us. For the kingdom of God is within us. And Lord, we thank you tonight that we feel the presence and the comforting touch of your Holy Spirit. And we pray, Holy One of God, that as you move and exalt Jesus Christ tonight, that Lord, we'll see in him something we have never seen before, that our love will increase, and that Lord, all the other things that are mundane and earthly will slip away, and that Jesus Christ will be exalted and glorified. For we have no kingdoms to build and no name to preach but your kingdom in your name. And Father, no man can deliver and no man can heal. No man can save. It must be done through the power of your Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus Christ. And so we acknowledge thee tonight as Lord. We acknowledge thee tonight as King of Kings. We acknowledge thee tonight as Savior and Baptizer and Deliverer. And Lord, we know that one day that you're coming to be glorified in your people. And tonight as we've come to this convention, Lord, as the people of God, the members of your body have gathered together, we have come for the sole purpose that we might be cleansed, or we might move higher in the things of the Lord Jesus, and that his character will be developed and built within us, that this evolution of the metamorphosis of the Spirit within us will bring the image of Jesus Christ one day to the forefront, and they will be glorified within and without, and the world will see the sons of God manifested, for they have not seen it yet, but the day is coming, Father, and we believe it, and so we pray to that end, and Lord, pray for the cleansing and the sprinkling of your blood, and the deliverance that comes in the name of Jesus, and so tonight we bind our principalities and powers, we take authority over every demon power, we take authority over every problem, every emotion. We take authority over every vain imagination. And tonight we cast them down in the authority of Jesus' name. For we believe there's power and authority in the name of Jesus Christ. We believe tonight that there's power in the blood of the Lord Jesus. And not only do we have forgiveness of sins, but we have the remission of sins. Where we can live and walk above sin, Father, and show the righteousness of Jesus Christ as it is imparted by the Spirit to our lives. And so we seek first tonight the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these other things shall be added unto us. So have your way, Holy Spirit, in our lives, in this place, in the days that are to follow, and Lord, give us the deliverance that we ask for in our own hearts, that we might walk out free in the Holy Ghost, liberated, unrestrained, men without bondages, women without bondages, but Lord, moving in the power and the authority of the Holy Spirit, and abiding in Jesus Christ. And so we lift up your name and exalt you, Lord Jesus, so glorify yourself tonight. Bear your mighty arm and show forth the glory and the power in the name of Jesus Christ. Give your Lord your name. Give it what it deserves in this earth. Lord, give it to it the glory and the honor and the exaltation that belongs to it. For so long, Father, it's been an upset gospel. But tonight we believe there's power and that we're not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. For it is the power of God and the salvation. To those that believe, and we believe tonight, that the power of the Lord, the power of the name, can liberate the captive. 
chapter from and bring deliverance, Father, deliverance for the people of God, that they might move in authority, move in the Holy Ghost, and show forth the character of Jesus Christ. So manifest your power tonight in every heart and every life, and my God will be pleased to give you the praise, you the honor and the glory, for we ask it in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior and Master. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. I was thinking as I was seeking the Lord today, that it's important that as you and I come together, how we hear. For as you and I hear what the Spirit has to say, then faith can be generated. And as faith is generated in your life, then through the days to follow and the prayer sessions that we'll have together, God can wonderfully and marvelously set you free. We were in Butuan, Philippines, and <clears throat> was a fellowship there that I was joined to through the Spirit, and so I ministered there quite frequently. And one Sunday as I was ministering in the fellowship of believers, uh, there was a nurse, a registered nurse, who was taking care of an invalid mother, and she wasn't in the service. But because it was in a home and the believers were there, and God was moving, suddenly prophecy came forth, and her door was open up into the bedroom, and suddenly the Spirit of God began to deal with her. She was a Christian, baptized in the Holy Ghost. And at the close of that service, after God had spoken, why she came to me and was weeping and said, I must see you privately. And so I went up and she began to share with me the problems of her life. And she said, just two weeks ago, I tried to smother the lady that I'm working with, the lady that I'm helping and, and nursing here. She said, I became so frustrated and there were so many bondages in my life that as I was ministering and as I was nursing this woman, the impulse came to put a pillow over her head and smother her. And she said, I began to do it, and then, by the grace of God, I didn't finish. I stopped. And as she shared these things, uh, we began to deal with her on the area of deliverance. And in this city of Butuan, the principality and power that ruled it was a witch who was Roman Catholic and who had many, many followers. And they called her Endelita, and this lady for years has been in the city of Butuan, and she goes into seances and says that she has the spirit of the child Jesus. And when this spirit takes over and she goes into this trance, why then she speaks as a little child, and people come to her, doctors and lawyers and government officials. They come not only for blessing, but they come for healing. And when they come for healing, and she goes into this trance, why her tongue comes out, and a needle comes out of the end of her tongue, and she injects these people with this needle, and that is a transference of demon power. And so as we began to unravel the history of this nurse, we found out that she had been taken to this lady in her younger years and had gone for healing, and she had been injected. And so we prayed for the spirit of witchcraft and those spirits that were transferred to her life, and God began to wonderfully set her free. And it was a tremendous work of grace as God worked into her life and set her free from witchcraft and the potions that they drink over in these lands of Asia. The, we think demon power is bad here, but when we reach there, it's the things that you see and the things that you hear are almost beyond your reasoning. You cannot believe that the enemy has so much power in so many lives. And so we began to move into this realm over there in Butuan, and many, many people got deliverance from this uh, transference of spirits. And this nurse got wonderfully set free. And then we found out this mother that she was nursing, who was quite elderly, this, nur this first nurse that we prayed for had gone away, and another nurse had taken over for that period of time. And she was also a follower of this witch. And she had cursed this mother sometime in the period that she was nursing with her. And so we began to pray for this old lady and things began to happen. And the important thing, that the, the point that I'm trying to bring out tonight is this, that as you are here for these 
sessions of deliverance, it's important how you hear. Because as you hear, there will be people that hear, and yet they think they're hearing, and yet nothing is happening. But you that are really moving into the Spirit of God, and are listening to what the Spirit of God has to say, something will happen in your heart tonight, and you can get deliverance tonight, and if not tonight, as the days go on, God will begin to set you free. I saw, I guess, registered deliverances in the six weeks I was away, between eight to a thousand people set free through the power of God. And these are registered deliverances. They had to sign their name and place the, and put on their cards the problems they had, and there were areas that uh, are just almost unbelievable. But these are registered uh, deliverances, and in Jakarta, we met with different people that were in the government, and also we prayed for a retired general of the Indonesian Police Department, and God wonderfully set him free, and I was telling Brother Glenn that he's given to me a letter of introduction to the ambassador of Indonesia in Ottawa, in my country, that, he, that I can go and visit this ambassador, who is a Christian, and begin to talk to him about deliverance, for he says that this family are Christians, but they need deliverance, and so he's given me this letter, and to go to Ottawa and see this ambassador and pray for his deliverance. So you pray that God will begin to open doors. I also uh, told Brother Glenn, and maybe I shared it with you, that the cabinet of uh, President Reagan, the Secretary of Interior, James Watt, is a personal friend of mine, and this brother, who is now the Secretary of the Interior of, the, of Reagan's cabinet, has gone through deliverance. That man has gone through deliverance because I prayed for him in Denver, Colorado. I prayed for him and his wife, his son, who was in Old Roberts University, has also gone through deliverance. His daughter has gone through deliverance. And they, in turn, are praying for people for deliverance. So you pray for James Watt. I'm not sure about the political part of it. All I know is that he's a man of God. He's baptized in the Holy Ghost. He believes in deliverance. And they understand the message of sonship. And so he's in a strategic position, and we're believing God. And God will use him in the White House and in all the decisions that he makes. So you just continue to pray that God will have his way in these areas. Now, I want to do some teaching tonight, because I think it's important that we teach tonight, and then as we teach from the charts in the following days, to, to bring to you the truth of deliverance as God is showing it to me. And I don't say that... I have all the answers. I find that, like Abraham, I'm into a strange country that I've never been before. And this strange country, if you want to just look at it for a minute, I'll just share that scripture with you. God showed it to me. I'm not sure whether I've shared it with you before. But it's in Hebrews 11. In Hebrews 11, before we get into the message, Hebrews 11, 8. <clears throat> it says here, By faith Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for inheritance... And so that's what we're doing. We are going to receive for an inheritance the heavenlies, where the government of Satan now rules. You and I will be ruling in God's government. We believe this. So by faith now, and that's why it says in Hebrews 11, 8, the two words, by faith, Abraham, when he was called to go into Canaan, it says he went, he was called, he went out into the place which he should after receive for inheritance. And he was to get it for an inheritance, just as you and I are. He obeyed, and he went out not knowing whither he went. And this area of spirits and in deliverance is an area that is foreign to many, many people. Now, I realize that God is making deliverers of all of us. It's not a one-man ministry. Do you believe that? It's not a one-man ministry. If it was a one-man ministry, it would never get done. But God is using body ministry. God is using members of His body who are coming into the knowledge of deliverance, getting set free. They become the partaker of the fruit themselves, just as you do with salvation or the baptism. Then you, in turn, after you have received this knowledge, are going out and you are washing one another's walk or cleansing each other's walk, as the Bible talks about. And so Abraham, he went out, and he didn't know whether he went, but he went by faith, and it says he sojourned in the land of promise, just as you and I are. Our place is in the heavenlies. We are to be spiritual men and women of God. That's the place, and we've already talked about going higher tonight, and this is where God wants us, this is where we should stay, as our position in Jesus Christ. He sojourned in the land of promise, is in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, 
and heirs with him of the same promise, for he looked for a city who, who, which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. And so you and I, as we walk into this area of deliverance and believe God and cast down Jericho, the bulwark of Canaan, and also they take care of all the other areas, the principalities and powers and the spirits and the small fry and the, the large fry and the generals and the colonels and whatever else we have up there, we must continue to keep a balance and remember that deliverance is only a fringe benefit to the fullness of God. That's all. And this is why it's so important to have deliverance along with sonship as you have here in, in uh, this camp. And I thank God for Glenn and Irma for the, for the balance of sonship and deliverance. You can get off into deliverance and then you can get away off or you can get off way into sonship. And I want to move into sonship. I want to move into the fullness of God. But I've often found how in the world do I get there? One thing to have the theory and say, well, I believe in it, and I do believe in it, but sonship is the way to it. And so as God cleans us out and cleans us up and begins to show us the areas of our lives that need to be cast out, then, beloved, we'll move into the fullness and in the authority and the power of God. Just we had a, you know, I had in my church, I, I think it's still there. I was gone six weeks to Indonesia and Philippines and Hong Kong, and then... I went to Florida for two weeks because I was in, in not very good shape when I got home <clears throat> because I was working from 6 in the morning till sometimes 12 and 1 o'clock in the next morning plus preaching and plus the counseling sessions that I had. And so we were two weeks in Florida, just got back Tuesday, through our Wednesday, and uh, here until Tuesday, so I'll get back Wednesday, and I think I still have a congregation. But we have elders, and God is training and moving up into the spirit realm. So we thank God for this. I want you to turn with me now to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17. <coughs> and here in Ephesians 6, verse 17, I want to look at the last part of the 17th verse. We'll read the full verse, verse 17, but it's the last part that we want to dwell on and try to, as we can through the Holy Ghost, build into your heart faith that will come by the Spirit, that will be generated by the Spirit, so that when it comes for you to receive deliverance, you can receive deliverance just by trusting and believing God. I saw people get deliverance in, in Indonesia, had never heard it, but one time, who immediately received what the Spirit was saying to them and received deliverance of the power of God without the laying on of hands. And I think this is going to have to come to this eventually. In Ephesians 6, verse 17, it says, Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Now, the last part is what we want to look at. And the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Now, this might not be new to some of you people. It was a few months ago that God, in His great mercy, I sat down and I said, Lord, what am I going to minister? And this was on us for us a uh, Wednesday night. I said, Lord, what am I going to minister? And suddenly the Spirit said, Speak on Rima. Just use the word Rima. And so I began to go into my strong concordance because I'm not a Greek scholar, Hebrew scholar, but I used the concordance and, and Barry's interlinear and I began to see truth that kind of built up faith into my heart. And so here it says, And the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. The Word of God, for the word word, W-O-R-D, you and I know there are two Greek words, Logos and Harima. Two Greek words. This word, here in the Greek, means harima. It's spelled R-H-E-M-A in the Greek, but it's pronounced harima. And here the reference is not to the whole Bible, but it's to the individual scriptures or which the Spirit brings to your remembrance or to your heart for you to use in time of need. Now, how many times have you been uh, in under pressure? How many times have you... Uh, been discouraged, we'll say, and things have happened contrary to the, to, the, to the situation that you find yourself in, everything negative. And all of a sudden, as you're kind of seeking the Lord, suddenly a word will be dropped into your spirit. And if that word is dropped into your spirit, all of a sudden you know faith is there, the situation doesn't matter anymore, the, the negative things that you see it doesn't affect you anymore. You kind of lift it out of that depression, out of that discouragement, 
because God has spoken to you a word. Many times you read the Scriptures, you study the Word of God, and all of a sudden the Word of God comes alive to you, and you see something you've never seen before. And it's so thrilling to you, you run around and you start to show it to people, and you're all excited, and, and you're telling them what this is, and the truth that God's showing you, they look at you, and they're not excited at all. And you don't understand why they're not excited, because you just are overwhelmed with this thing. But you see, God has spoken to you. God has given to you an arima that has suddenly generated revelation in your heart. It's illuminated the scriptures and faith has come and you've been just so thrilled with it that you had to share it with somebody. So that's what I've got to do for the next few days. I'm going to share some of the truth that God's given to me. And if you don't get excited, that's all right. I'll get excited for you, all right? But the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God or the Harima of God, and that's what this word is. It's the harima of God, and it's this spirit, or the sword that the Spirit takes, this word that the Spirit will take and penetrate into the very innermost recesses of your heart, and when that word comes, something will happen. Now let me just give you the word belief. There are people who come into a healing meeting, and you and I have been there, in fact I saw it, where people, the preach, the preaching was done, and, and, and then they'd call a healing line, and my God, there were so many people that were sick that hundreds of them would come for healing, yet hundreds were never healed. They'd come up to the healing line, somebody lay hands on them, and they're putting them through like uh, an assembly plant, and lay hands and in the name of Jesus, and they're going through like this, and I'm looking at it and saying, my God, there's something wrong here. Something wrong here. All these people are coming for healing, and maybe one out of a hundred, or whatever it is, is getting healed. But what's happening? They have belief. There isn't anyone here in this meeting tonight that does not have belief in the Word of God. Or you wouldn't be here. You believe the Word of God. I believe the Word of God. But the devil believes the Word of God. But he's not saved. He believes. And so we can believe the Word of God when we read the Scriptures, by His stripes, Isaiah says, by His stripes, you are healed. Peter looks back to Calvary and says, by His stripes, you were healed. No, we believe that. And so we get into a meeting where somebody preaches healing, and we believe the Word of God, and so we'll come up for healing, but when, we get, when the hands are laid on us, we'll walk away many times and we're not healed. And the devil will come to us and say, well, you didn't have enough faith, or the evangelist will say you didn't have enough faith, or something on, and you, you get depressed and you're more discouraged and you don't know whether to come up again because you don't know whether you're going to get healed or not. What you need is an arima by the Spirit of God. Now, I want you to hear me clearly. Because belief suggests a mental acceptance without implying a certitude or a certainty on the part of the believer. You can believe the Word of God and you can mentally accept the Word of God, but that doesn't mean that any faith has been generated. You get into a, a meeting of, we'll say, when, when Billy Graham or one of these uh, salvation evangelists will preach... You might have five or ten thousand people. Maybe out of five or ten thousand people, you could have a thousand or two thousand people sitting there unsaved. The message goes forth on salvation, but maybe out of that two thousand, only three, four, or five hundred will receive the Lord Jesus. What happened to the other fifteen hundred? Maybe they didn't believe, or maybe they believed, but something was not generated inside. They needed to feel that quickening. They needed to feel that something from the Spirit to draw them. How many times I sat in a salvation meeting and it really never turned me on much. But the moment that I sat in the meeting and the Holy Spirit began to penetrate with the sword of the Spirit, this harima, and it came into my spirit, I had conviction. And when conviction came, I knew before they took the altar call that I had to make my stand for Jesus Christ and come up and confess that I was a sinner. Because God had spoken to me. And when He spoke to me about what I was and where I was, suddenly faith was given to me. And I made that step and obeyed and moved up and God did the work of grace in my heart and life. Now faith implies the certitude and full trust and confidence in the source who is God, whether there's any objective evidence or not. Now, you understand what I'm saying? When faith comes, it does not matter 
what the situation is around you. It does not matter what the circumstances are. If it's healing that you need and you are in pain, but the Word of God has gone forth and the Spirit of God has spoken to you and said, this is your night and you know you're here, you can stand up and say, I'm here, and maybe they'll look at you and say, well, I don't see that crippled leg any better. But you know that you have been healed by the power of God. And even though the evidence on the outside doesn't show it, you know on the inside, and nobody can change that. How many understand what I'm saying? The same with salvation. When people get saved, you say, well, how do you know you're saved? And if they're really a novice and, and, and just new babes, they say, well, I, I don't know the Scriptures. I mean, I can't tell you about the Scriptures, but I just know. Yeah, but how do you know? Well, I don't know how I know, but I know that I do know because I know that I am. And, and people look and say, well, but, but how do you, well, I don't know how I but I know. Something's happened. Down inside, the Spirit of God has witnessed and done something so that even though the devil says you're not saved, the devil works in all these negative situations, you say, I just know it. I just know it. I just know it. And the same with healing. It, it comes the same way. You say, the devil says you're not, and he'll give you a pain, and he'll, he'll work on you with symptoms, and yet, and, and, the, and the outward evidence isn't there, yet you're saved, but I know I'm healed. Somebody says, well, listen, you're, you're a fanatic. You hear you say you're healed, and you're going to throw your pills away, and, and, and you're throwing them away, and you've got all these symptoms, but you say, I know. But how do you know? I, I just know. And that's where you and I have to come to. For so long, for so long, People have been in bondage because they haven't received healing, haven't received deliverance. They go home and the devil begins to accuse them and speak to them and tell them things. And they, and, and they try to exercise a faith that comes through mental gymnastics. And they say, well, I, I believe I'm saved. I believe the Word of God. I stand in the Word of God. I believe the Word of God. And some people have been foolish enough to throw their pills away and they've been buried. What we're trying to do is keep a balance. God's Word is true. From cover to cover. Everything in it is true. Everything in it I believe. Everything in it you believe. But the place must, the, the, the time comes in the Word of God where the Spirit of God must take what we read and what we believe is God's Word and believe it to be true and speak to you as an individual. Amen. And when He speaks to you as an individual, all hell can come against you, but brother and sister, they make no difference. As an illustration, and I won't mention the person's name because they're a prominent family in Washington, D.C., but when I passed it in that area a few years ago, maybe I've shared this with you, I don't know, but I, it comes to me by the Spirit. This lady was committed to a mental institution. She was committed to a mental institution. Her husband was a, a prominent surgeon, and, and uh, she had been coming to our meetings. And, and uh, one morning I got a call on a Wednesday morning, and the call was that so-and-so has been sent and incarcerated in an institution in Maryland. She was taken from D.C. over state line into Maryland, put into a private institution. Her husband was paying so many hundred dollars a week to keep her there, and he was going to keep her there for so many months so they could declare her legally insane, so all the money she had would come back to him, and he could become a trustee of the estate and so on, or the executor of the estate. And this was the whole program. I received the call in the morning, and when I did, suddenly the Spirit of God witnessed to me in my heart and said, she is in there because of religious convictions. I have no papers. I have nothing. All I know is I received the phone call. The Spirit of God spoke to me, and I knew without a shadow of a doubt that that lady was in that institution because her husband had placed her there because she had been baptized in the Holy Ghost, spoke in tongues, and so on. But I had no evidence. In nine days... After nine days, God had her out. Nine days. Nine days. <clears throat> I retained an attorney. There was a friend of ours, the interior, the Secretary of Interior. That's how I got to know him. And his wife just happened to be in our church that one, the following night, that Wednesday night for the service. And I happened to mention from the pulpit. And that's how, you know, God is so wonderful the way he just brings things together. I didn't even know these people existed. And so I stand up there on the pulpit at the Bible uh, teaching and I said, so and so has been put in an institution. I believe she's there because of religious convictions. Let's pray. And in the congregation that night was 
uh, this lady, and she was sitting there, and I didn't know she knew this other lady, and she did. So after the service had come up, and she said, my husband's an attorney, a lawyer, and maybe he can help you get her out. So that's how the whole thing evolved. And so by the time we got into the mental institution, we had retained another attorney, and when we did, he had gotten the committal papers from this private institution, which never happened. When they commit you and they have those private committal papers, nobody gets them. But this psychiatrist made a mistake and he gave it to our attorney. And when he got the papers, we couldn't hold off. We ran out and got them Xerox and had all these papers Xerox. And in the embodiment of those committal papers was, this woman was declared legally insane because she speaks in other tongues, has praying partners, talks about the sprinkling of the blood, and a few other things in there, and I knew we had a bombshell. And once we had those papers, you can believe they weren't in much of a hurry to keep her in anymore. Because when we called them, we said, if you don't let her out, we'll take these committal papers to the Washington Post, and we'll blow your institution wide open, you let her out. And that was the time when the charismatic movement was really taking off in the Washington, D.C. area. And so in nine days, I got a phone call, and on the other end of the phone was this lady, and she said, George? And I said, Jesus, this is Johnny. And I said, it's who? I was like, you know, remember when Peter was in jail, everyone was praying to get him out, and Peter gets out and knocks on the door, and Dorcas says, who's there? And they said, it's Peter. She said, it can't be. She runs back to the fellows that are praying to get Peter out. She says, Peter's out. But it can't be Peter. And they were praying all the time, God get him out, so God gets him out, and they don't believe he's out. You know, that's the way we pray. Lots of faith. And uh, she was out in nine days, and we just give God the praise. But what had happened? God had spoken to me and Harima by the Spirit, and it didn't make any difference what the situation, what situations came, what was negative. All of it didn't make any difference. I knew, and somebody said, well, how do you know? Maybe she is crazy. But I knew she wasn't crazy, and it proved to be true. And when that happens, God can do anything. Anything. And so God's Word says, and it's found in Matthew 17, 20, and I want you to, to write these scriptures down. And Jesus said, Matthew 17, 20, Jesus said unto them, Because of your unbelief, for verily I say unto you, if ye have faith, if you have faith, as a grain of mustard seed, you shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Now, we've taken that as a, in a natural form. But I believe what God is telling us, if we have faith, and this faith will come by the Spirit, and I'll prove it to you, that when this faith comes to us, it does not make any difference what is before us. When that faith comes, nothing can stop it. And when we speak the word, if we say it, whatever happens, that mountain will be removed because of the faith that God has deposited by the Spirit into your heart, and you'll just keep right on going. Look what it says. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. This word of faith, this harima of faith, a utterance as we preach the word of God. And that's why, and, and I, don't, I don't want to knock anything or knock anybody, but you cannot get faith through stories. You'll never have faith developed through me telling you some tear-jerking emotional story. It can work on your emotions. It can work on the soulish area of your life. But the Bible says, preach the Word. Preach the Word. Because it's the Word of God, this Logos, this Word, this divine Logos, as we preach it, then the Spirit of God can take the Logos and speak from it and harem it to your heart and life. That's why when you hear a lot of stories and and. and they just don't do anything for you. They can build you up emotionally. And you can cry, and you can weep, but I can go watch a soap opera and cry. Come on, you know what I'm talking about. It's got to be the Word of God. And what God's doing now is bringing His people back to the Word of God. Back to Revelation. It's always been there. Always been there. 
But God is bringing out truth, bringing out revelation, so that the Word of God becomes engrafted within us, so that when that time comes when the Spirit of God is, has preeminence in our life, He can take that engrafted Word and speak to us through it and by it and generate the faith so we can become men and women of faith and do the works that God wants us to do. Now, this Word of faith is a rima in Romans 10.8. And so we go on into John 15, verse 5. Look at John 15, verse 5. And these scriptures are all important. He says here, I am the vine, Jesus says, you are the branches. Now here's the condition. He that abideth in me, and I in him. Two things. It's one thing to have Christ in you. It's another thing for you to be in Christ. And that's important. People have put it all together so many times, but I'll show it to you if we get to it while I'm here on the tabernacle. It's one thing for you to have the kingdom of God in you, but it's another thing to you to be in the authority or abiding in Jesus Christ. So he says, He that abideth in him and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. And we can't. My God, every time I get up to preach... It scares me to death. When you say, what do you mean? Because I know that unless God does the work of grace, unless God flows by the Spirit, unless people are ready and they've come and, and their hearts are prepared and God has prepared them, that nothing's going to be happening. But I believe because of, the, of this camp and because of the years of ministry here that when people come now, they're ready for deliverance. They know what they're coming for. They're desperate enough to come all this way, get into the place and say, I want deliverance. And it isn't George the Lord's going to bring it to you. It's the Spirit of God through the authority of Jesus Christ. And that's what you've got to learn. And if you don't learn anything else, you'll learn one thing. That I do not do kingdoms. Brother, sister, there are people I've been to places where people have been set free. I don't even know their names. They've been set free, and they, they thank God for it. And when I've left, I don't even remember what they were delivered from. I don't remember their names, because I don't want to know. I just want Jesus Christ to get the glory that belongs to Him. If I can keep in that place, God can use me. But if I get out of that place, then God can put me on the shelf, and I become ineffective to the body of Jesus Christ. Not only me, but you. Because when God begins to use you, if you begin to exalt yourself and develop pride and let the enemy come in, he can place you on the shelf and you're somebody else that is humble enough to be used by the Spirit of God. So George Leroy doesn't do anything. And I want you to understand that. Without me, Jesus says, you can do nothing. Luke one thirty-seven. I'll just quote it to you for you. For with God, nothing shall be impossible. Do you believe it? Nothing. Nothing shall be impossible. For with God, no word or utterance shall be impossible. And so we find out in John 15, 5, when he says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. Now look at John 6, 63 for a minute. He says in John 6, 63, It is the Spirit that quickeneth. The Spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profiteth nothing. How many places, how many times have you been where it's been all flesh? People have tried to be healed in the flesh, delivered in the flesh, saved in the flesh. They, they scare them into the hell and, and figure that's going to do the job. Or they'll get them into all kinds of emotional stories and that seems to do the job. And they come up in an emotional rush. And then they go back out in the system and we lose them. Done in the flesh, the flesh profits nothing. It must be done by the Holy Ghost. It must be done in the Holy Ghost. It may do, must be done in that spiritual realm where God can move because it's His Spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, Jesus said, they are Spirit and they are life because when the Spirit speaks, He brings life. When the flesh speaks, it brings death. So it must be the Spirit that brings life. Now look at John. We see it here in 6, 6, 63. They are spirit and they are life. Now the word in John 6, 63, the word that I speak, this is harima. That's what it says. Harima. Words that I speak. Harima. This idea of pouring forth the harima of God. 
The harem of God. In John 8, 47, He that is of God, what's it say in John 8, 47? He that is of God, heareth God's words. You're not hearing my words. If I'm in the way, and you hear my words, you've got a problem. But he says, here in John 8, 37, He that is of God, heareth God's words. How is he hearing it? By the Spirit. By the Spirit. Here's God's word. Ye therefore hear them not, because you are not of God. There are people that are not of God outside. They don't. You can talk from the Word of God, and they don't even know you're quoting the Word of God. There are people that hear the Word of God many times, Christian people, and they miss what the Spirit's saying. It goes right by them. Sonship for one, deliverance for another. How many have heard that the Word of God on deliverance? And, and, and Brother Glenn knows this. And I, when I was in the Philippines and in Indonesia, the people that would not cooperate with the Crusades were the Pentecostal people, the Assemblies of God people. They would not cooperate. Why? Because they've already arrived. I don't know where they've arrived to, but they've arrived. You say, well, brother, I say, well, hi, listen, I was Assemblies of God for over 20 years. And I finally got out. Because they wouldn't let me stay in. <laughs> good or bad, there's some good brothers and sisters. What you see, the big problem is they're not hearing what the Spirit of God's saying. And you see, to get to the people, you've got to get to the pastor. And the pastor can't be dirty. He's got to be perfect. But I found out I was dirty. I found out I needed cleansing. I found out that I still need cleansing. In Indonesia, I was praying for an evangelist in Indonesia and happened to pray for two hours, the depression and frustration, and when I laid hands on him, I choked. So he threw up and I threw up with him and I said, Praise God, I got my deliverance from depression and frustration. However, just a few months ago, before I left for the Philippines, we had a Roman Catholic charismatic brother who was a teacher in one of the Roman Catholic charismatic groups. His wife was coming and getting tremendous deliverance. And so he's such a change in his wife. And he was going to the Roman Catholic Church. And she was coming to our church. And he didn't think this was right. And so he prayed about it and said, well, I'll go see what's going on. And he came in and uh, we got to know him a little bit. And he's a very, intellectual, very intelligent man. And <clears throat> he said, well, brother... I'll get my deliverance here, and I'll go back to the Roman Catholic Church and the charismatic group, and he said, I'll kind of take it to them. So I prayed for him for deliverance, and he kept coming. And then one Sunday morning, we went into a deliverance service, and he was sitting two rows from the front, and his big problem was he had too much intelligence. He had done too much reading. He had been studying for the priesthood, and he was really up there intellectually, and so he was sitting there, and he said to the Lord, Lord, you know my problem is my mind. It's in my head. And I just happened to hit doctrines of devils, seducing spirits, and traditions of men, and as I bound that spirit, he lifted his heart, and the Lord said, Lord, if that's what's wrong with me, then do something for me. And when we prayed, suddenly he felt electricity, just electricity on top of his head. He didn't know anything had happened, and he said, the Monday, and a magazine that should have arrived a month before, Arrived a month late and came the Monday after the Sunday that we'd prayed. And he said, I opened it up and here was somebody talking about transubstantiation, the Eucharist, and the Virgin Mary. And he said, any other time I looked at that, I shut it up and said, that guy's an error. But he said, as I read that magazine for the first time in my life, he said, it opened up to me in Revelation and I knew I was wrong. And that man realized that the deliverance had happened to him Sunday morning, and so he called it circumcision of the mind. I call it circumcision of the heart. He got circumcised in his mind, and God cut him loose from all the traditions and the bondages of that Roman Catholic Church. He went back. He turned in his uh, credentials. He said, I'm not teaching here anymore. And he left there and has never gone back. He's come to our fellowship, and he's a tremendous man of God, and God is moving in his heart. But God had done something to him. And it was just this man, when he knew I was going to Indonesia, he said, Brother, and he gave me some scriptures the Lord had given to him. And when we read these scriptures, it didn't seem to make any sense. But in the scriptures he'd given me, there was talk something about this prophet being sick with uh, cancer or boils. And one, one Wednesday night, we were in a, a meeting in our church, and one of the ladies got a word of knowledge. He said, Pastor, would you pray for the spirit of cancer? I said, All right, dear. And we began to pray for the spirit of cancer. And when I did... 
I began to feel very, very sick. And so as we prayed, there was a general mass uh, deliverance meeting, and I ran into the office. I called one of the elders, laid hands on me, and I threw up the spirit of cancer. And when it came out, I should have known then that I should have had the elder lay hands on me and pray for the spirit of death. Because with cancer comes the spirit of death, with recklessness is the spirit of death, with suicide there's the spirit of death. And so I never thought about it. I came out, we continued our deliverance services, and God was doing a great work. And the Lord knew I had to get to the Philippines and Indonesia. He didn't want me dying somewhere. So he sent a boy all the way from out, out west. I think Edmonton, this boy, he was a Lutheran, had just been saved. His wife had left him. He had tried to commit suicide. So he'd come all the way down to Toronto to visit his mother-in-law who was coming to our church. And he came in and he heard about deliverance and knew he needed it. So we set up an appointment for him and I was praying for him for suicide. And of course, I prayed for him for a spirit of death. And when I laid hands on him for the spirit of death, God delivered me from that spirit of death. And I didn't want this young fellow to see me throw up, so as he was throwing up, I stuck my head outside the door and threw up. And I figured he'd miss it. But you see, the Sunday, he got up and he began to share about his deliverance. He said, and you know what? He said, it left me and went into the pastor. <laughs> I said, brother, it didn't go into me. It was already there. <laughs> But that's deliverance. When God begins to speak to you by the Spirit, you're going to feel that something on the inside stirring. Because you'll know, ah, this is what I, this is what I need. And so it's the Spirit that quickeneth, he says. And Jesus said, I speak unto the, the, these words that I speak. They are Spirit and they are life. Now, he said, he that is of God heareth God's words. Ye for therefore hear them not, because you are not of God. Now, look at Romans 10, 17. Now, I heard the little buzzer go off. I told my daughter, I said, Honey, you said it for 45 minutes, and you let that thing go off so I can hear it, because I don't want to preach it to death, because I, I'm like these events, I don't want to dump it all on you at once, and I've got to go all the way to Monday, you see? And I don't want to dump it all on you at once and get you worn out. But in Romans 10, 17, now look at this. So then faith... Cometh by what? Hearing. Now, we all have ears. But this is not what he's talking about. He is not talking about this kind of hearing. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God, or by a word of God. The Spirit's word. As we listen, suddenly... The Spirit of God takes this Word and becomes the sword of the Spirit and He hits you with it away down in your spirit. And when it comes, this faith begins to activate. You don't listen. Somebody says, you have faith, Brother Roy. Well, I have whatever God gave me when I got saved. But I don't have any faith. It comes from the Lord Jesus. He's the author and the finisher of it. Somebody says, well, what about when you pray for deliverance? I don't feel. There's things that I don't even feel. I laid hands on people in, in the Indonesia. I laid hands on one young boy. The crowds were there at the front. I don't know this young fellow. They'd all come up all at once for deliverance. And so I just laid hands on this young guy. Didn't even know anything about him. When I had hands on him, I didn't feel anything. The power of God hit that boy. He hit that floor. He almost scared me to death because I wasn't expecting it. He hit that floor, and all of a sudden those spirits of martial arts began, and all the karate stuff started to go, and he's jumping up off that floor. His feet are coming out, and whatever the kung fu, whatever the other stuff they were doing, and I'm standing back, and people are standing there, come out in the name of Jesus. I said, let him alone. I mean, I didn't start it. Let God handle it. I didn't fight him. I was like, that's up to God. God knocked him down. God can finish it. And, and I'm standing back, and I see all this thing going on. I thought, that's the greatest advertisement i ever had in my life. And people are looking at this boy, and he can't move. You know, he's trying to struggle and all this karate stuff and beautiful. Was, and that spirit's coming out of him, coming out of him, throwing up. And when it wouldn't come out, the other one would activate. And all of a sudden, he just fell back like a limp rag. It was all over. No, God, well, God did it. God did it. I didn't feel anything. But he felt it. And brother... When God speaks by the Spirit, and you are, and He was up there, He was up there because God had spoken to him by the Spirit. Nobody called him up. It was the Holy Ghost that had drawn him up to the front. And God knew that I laid hands on him. He was the first one to lay hands on. And there you're moving by the Spirit. I don't even know you're moving by the Spirit. 
Yeah, that's beautiful. You don't have to worry about anything. You just go ahead and do what you're supposed to do. And all of a sudden something happens and like old Dorcas, you sit back and say, well, I didn't expect it, but thank God, Lord, you're terrific. You battle it, you handle it, and you just let the Lord do the job. Faith cometh by hearing. Hearing, he says. Hearing by the Word or by a Word of God. Galatians 3, 5. He therefore that ministereth to you the Spirit, and worketh miracles among you, doeth he it by the works of the law, or by the hearing of faith. Sure. By the hearing of faith. That's how miracles are wrought. People get healed. Somebody says, you know, it takes the mystery out of it all. It takes, you know what takes the mystery out of it all? It takes all the charisma for all of these idol, you know, all these uh, men, men of faith and power, whatever you want to call these guys, men of faith and power, you know, they come out there and they stand up. And God's man of faith and power, hogwash, hogwash. All it is, it is, he's preached the word, preached the word. And the Holy Ghost, who is omnipresent and whom we cannot see, is moving just like he's moving tonight over our hearts and our minds. And he's talking to us as that Logos is being preached. And as he talks to us, suddenly we're feeling something on the inside. And then when that evangelist, whoever it is, says, I want a healing line, he comes up because he feels to come up. And when that miracle of healing takes place, that deaf ear is opened, or that cripple comes out of the wheelchair, or the paralysis goes, somebody says, <gasps> Marvelous, and everybody rushes to the evangelist. That's not the evangelist, brother. It's not that man. It's because God has already worked on that person's heart. I prayed for a lady. This was a few years ago. I'd had a uh, Women's Aglow meeting, and the lady, uh, she had invited another church. Now, this is how God works. This other church came in, and I didn't know that one of the ladies who was coming... God had already spoken to her the night before and said, when you go to that meeting, I'm going to deliver you. Now, I didn't know that. I didn't even know the lady. And all of a sudden, in the Women's Aglow meeting, the leader gets up and she said, now, before uh, Brother Leroy begins to preach, she said, I think maybe we should pray. Have, have him pray for some of you people. Well, of course, this lady that God said was going to get delivered, she was the first up. And so she came up, and I didn't know what she I said. What do you want me to? She just wants you to pray for me. And so I laid hands on her, and she hit the floor, and the demon started coming out of her. Now I was more surprised than she was because she already knew what was going to happen, and I didn't know a thing. But you see, it wasn't me. It was God. God, and we have got to get back to the place. Where we say, Lord, it's you. You do the work. You brought me. You're not here for chance. I believe it. God brought you here. Many of you are ready to receive deliverance. And some of you, as you get more instruction, and maybe you know much or more than I know about it, but as we share together, and as the Spirit of God witnesses together with us, God will generate the faith, and this will come to you, and miracles can be wrought. Deliverances are wrought to me. Being delivered is a miracle. It's a miracle. It's a miracle. I prayed for a man in Butuan who had already committed four murders. In fact, I think I've got the, the testimony. I'll read them one of these mornings, some of the testimonies. But it all, he'd committed four. He was a mercenary, and he'd committed four murders. But he was ready. Laid hands on him. There wasn't any violent reaction. That man was ready. And out those spirits of murder came, and he walked out delivered by the power of God. Delivered by the power of God. Because miracles were being wrought by the Spirit of God, and because they were hearing what the Spirit had to say, and faith is being generated. Didn't matter what the devil was saying, faith was there, and all they had to do was the point of contact and the laying on of hands. And so there must be a working of the Holy Ghost in these next few days that you and I are here, and you get a hold of God, you pray and ask God to work in your life and in your heart. How long have I preached? Oh, my goodness, and I just got started, Glenn. I just got started. <laughs> you know, for a flyweight, he sure has a heavy hand, doesn't he? <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, let's just a couple more scriptures and I'll, and I'll close off, all right? Somewhere. 
All right, let's look at Acts. Look at Acts 10.34 with me. Acts 10.34. A great portion of Scripture. You and I know it, but it's worth repeating and looking at. Here we have Peter going to the house of Cornelius, talking to them about the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Now, I don't think Peter expected anything tremendous. He, he was only going because God said, Go. You get there, and he said, You preach the truth, and you do what I tell you to do, and, you know, not, don't get in the way, keep out of the way, and don't ask too many questions. Just preach what I tell you to preach. And if you'll do the preaching, I'll take care of it. And, of course, God already worked on Peter's end. God already, already worked on the house of Cornelius. He'd already done the work, both sides. And so, when it's all over, something happens. He's finished preaching. Now, I haven't seen this happen yet, but I sure like to see it. A whole congregation get baptized in the Holy Ghost at once. Now, that would be a thrill. That would really be a thrill. Just preaching, and all of a sudden, as you've stopped or just about finished, the Holy Ghost moves and everybody's speaking in tongues. Well, that's the way it was in Indonesia when it came to deliverance. After you finished speaking, you gave an altar call for deliverance, and they all came up. And I wondered for a minute, do they really understand what I'm saying? But they understood, and they knew this was the answer. And so Peter, when it was finished, God does a word, and in verses of verse 34, Acts 10, Peter opening his mouth said, Have a prayer. I perceive that God is not a respectable person. Now, is deliverance just for me, or Glenn, or Irma, or for everybody? Everybody. Deliverance is for everybody. Not just for a special few, but it's for those who receive the Logos and believe it and then say, Lord, speak to me. Because, you see, as God, as we receive the Word and the Spirit of God knows we're receiving it, our heart, what does it say? The Word was not mixed with faith in them that heard. In Hebrews, it talks about the children of Israel. It says the Word was spoken, but it was not mixed with faith in them that heard it. The reason being because they closed their ears. They were dull of hearing. But you're open to it. Your ears are open to it. And because you're open to it, that's why you're here. And because you're here, then as God begins to speak, faith is generated, and you get your deliverance. Whatever area it is, God can set you free. Acts 10.35 But in every nation, he that fears him and works righteousness, acceptable to him is. Acts 10.43 To him all the prophets bear witness that everyone that believes on him receives what? Remission of sins through His name. Now, remission of sins, I believe, is the remitting who whatsoever I bind on earth is bound in heaven. Whatsoever I loose on earth is loosed in heaven. Whosoever sins are remitted are remitted. And that to me is those things on the inside. The sins that I did before I was, con uh, before I was converted and some of the things that I did after I was converted... These to me are sins that God says, I want to remit from you. I want to get rid of them. I've forgiven you. That's peace with God. But he said, I want to give you the remission of those things so that you'll have peace of God. The reason people have nervous breakdowns is because of the things they remember. Things, things they did. And I'll close with this. Just before I left for the Philippines or for Hong Kong, I was in Virginia at a meeting. And we had a meeting with a fellowship, and they were going through cleansing. And another lady, a lady who was Spanish, came in from another church. And as she set up the appointment for the next day when she came, I said to her, what's the problem? She said, well, I really, I'm not sure. She mentioned a couple of superficial areas. But she said, when I get into the kitchen, I have an 11-year-old daughter. If she's there and I'm in the kitchen and I pick up a knife, I want to kill her. And this lady was a... Christian baptized in the Holy Ghost. And she said, I don't understand what's wrong. But she said, when I pick up a knife, I want to put it into my daughter. So we began to pray for her and probe into some areas. And she said, you know, one thing in my life I cannot remember in my childhood. Up for the first seven or eight years, everything's a blank. I can't remember anything. We probed and began to counsel with her and pray for different areas. And then, as we began to pray, and she began to move into God, the anointing of God came on her, and she saw a vision. And when she was seeing this vision, she saw a little girl running down a dark hall. And as she saw this little girl, immediately she recognized it as herself. And as she saw this little girl running down this dark hall, she began to cry out right there in the room, Oh, Papa, my God, Papa! It hurts. It hurts, Papa. My God, Papa. 
And instantly God dropped into her mind incest. And then the whole thing came out that her father had committed incest with her when she was on five or six, and she had buried that thing out of her mind. It was in the subconscious, and so this thing was activating, the spirit of incest was activating, and she wanted to kill her daughter, and somehow it related and identified with her subconscious, trying to get this memory out. God delivered that woman, and brother and sister, the change that came over her, I saw her the next night, she brought her daughter for deliverance, and before I left for the Philippines, she called me from, from Virginia, and she was a transformed woman. Why? What had happened? God had already prepared her, and, and God did this work of deliverance in her life. And so what he talks about here is the truth. There's a remission of these things. You do not have to go on with your depressions, your discouragements, with your sicknesses. You do not have to go on. Now, the big problem I'm finding is there are so many spirits and so many areas that we need more of the word of knowledge so that we don't hit and miss. Come on. And I acknowledge that publicly. Many times it's hit and miss because there's so many areas. And yet there are other areas that immediately we get words of knowledge on. But you know what God's doing? He's teaching us how to take over Canaan. We're taking it a step at a time. He's driving those things out before us. It can't happen all at once because it would blow us away. And so he tells us, you go in, I'll drive them out, you possess the land. You come up into my glory to that level and walk it out, and then you'll find that I'll allow something else to come up. You get rid of it, kick the devil out, and then possess a little more. What's he doing? All the time, he's building his glory in us. He's building his image in us until one day, thy will be done in earth, in this earth, as it is in heaven. And there'll be a manifestation of the Son of God coming forth from us. Now, I'm going to stop there because there's a, I have a lot more. But I felt it was important. If you don't get deliverance tonight or tomorrow, don't get discouraged. God has deliverance for you. Amen? God has deliverance for you. There isn't anything God can't do. Believe me. I was 204 pounds one time. I've been down, I was down just when I came back from Indonesia to 155, but I think I'm up to about 160. I'm not going to get like him because, you know, in this country, with some of the hurricanes, I'd be scared to death, you know. <laughs> he walk out in a strong breeze and everyone's going to say, bye, Glenn. And then... Because he doesn't believe in the rapture, what's he going to do? Hear that? Here he's going up and him is saying, bye, Dan. <laughs> so he better pick up 15 more pounds, keep him around a little bit. But praise the Lord. God can do anything in our lives. If you've been praying for areas that you have not received deliverance in, don't get discouraged. It's just let God lead. Let God lead. He'll take care of it. He'll bring the situation around. But eventually you'll know, this is an area, it's got to go. And as you pray for one another, God will cleanse you. And I've found that to be true, and that is scriptural. James says, if we confess our faults one to another, and pray one for another, that you may be healed or delivered. And so it comes through praying one for the other. Somebody says, well, if I let my friends know what's going on inside, then they'll go out and tell everybody. Well, then they need deliverance from gossip. All right? Come on. Sure. And we tell it our own church. Everybody knows a lot of things. Now, a lot of the intimate areas, maybe they don't know. But a lot of areas they do know. And they're not afraid to stand up in a men's meeting and say, Yes, I have a problem here. I, I want to put my, when I have a fight with my wife, I want to put my wife's clothes on. Well, I know that's the spirit of transvestite. He can't help but that man, big masculine man, stand up and say that in front of 50 men. But they don't hide their face and laugh and oh, look at that guy. They get there and lay hands on him. Get him free for the glory of God so he becomes normal. Because the enemy's programmed him. The enemy's done the job on him. But for years we've kept it under the, under the rug. We've gone into church, looked like angels, all, all acted like devils, but looked like angels, and walked out and acted like devils again. So God says, let's clean it up. Let's clean up our act. Let's get rid of these things. Let's believe God and get this garbage out of our life so we can build the image of Jesus Christ on the inside. Let's bow our hearts together. 
Hallelujah. Father, we love you tonight. We love you. We love your spirit. We love your son. We love his name. We love his blood. We love that creative and living word that you have for us. We thank you for your authority. And we thank you for your power. And we believe, Lord Jesus, that you want to set the people of God free. We believe that, Father. And we know it's true. We know it's been happening here in Hot Springs. And Lord, Lord Jesus, this is just another night in many nights and weeks and months and years of deliverance that have been done already in this place. And so tonight, Father, we lift our hearts to you. And we ask you, Holy Spirit, now to come and move upon us through the power that you have for us. For you've said, I have given unto you power over all the power of the enemy. And we believe we have the authority. It doesn't make any difference what ability the devil has. We have the authority. And tonight we thank you for that authority because it's effectual and it's powerful and it's dynamite, Lord, that can blow the devil out of all of his kingdom from our hearts and lives because you want to clean us up. You want to change us into your image and move us from glory to glory even as by the Spirit of the Lord. And so tonight, Father, right now we pray, Holy Spirit of God, begin to move upon this place with your head bowed. If you have a desperate need, if you know, now there will be, we'll have time of counseling together. And if you feel tonight, yes, you really want deliverance, I want you to come and sit here in the front row. And then we're going to have some of the rest of the body stand behind you. So would you come, please, as we sing. We'll pull out these chairs, and we'll have you sit on the front. You come now as we sing the song together. You come, and if you want deliverance, I want you to sit here in these front chairs. And then we're going to have some of God's people come and stand behind. And what I want you to do is I want you to renounce it. Now, this is important. I want you to renounce those areas. I don't care what those areas are. And if there are five sitting here, I want the five of you just to renounce. I renounce in the name of Jesus Christ the spirit of. And if it's lust, I renounce the spirit of lust, depression, discouragement, worry, anxiety, confusion. I renounce all phobias, all fears in the name of Jesus. And begin to renounce these things. Doesn't forget what your neighbor's doing. I want you to do it. I want you to speak it out loud. Don't be inhibited. Don't be embarrassed. And then when you finish renouncing the areas of your life, and if there are sins that you remember, Spirits of inheritance, spirits of molestation, spirits of incest, spirits of masturbation. You know, these things used to frighten me one time. But my God, I've been around too long, and I've prayed for too many people. I know there are spirits of masturbation. I know there are spirits of incest, spirits of molestation. There are spirits of pornography, spirits of sensuality. There are spirits of, of uh, stimulation, erotic spirits. Spirits of flirtation, spirits of vanity. And these are things that, that God is showing us. And as we begin to renounce them, renounce them. Renounce the things that you're having trouble with. Say, I renounce the name, the spirit of, and renounce them. And then when you finish, we'll have that brother or sister lay hands on you. And when we lay hands on you, let the power of God begin to work. What you do is you breathe in the power of God. And you breathe out the spirit. Those spirits are already there. They have to be forced out. But you breathe in the power of God. And I've seen people as they breathe in, come unto me and drink, Jesus says. And out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. Well, I don't know how to drink the Spirit. And so all I know is I begin to breathe in the Spirit of God. And as I breathe in, the Spirit of God begins to throw out these other spirits. And I don't care how it happens. I just want it to happen tonight. And I have the authority. You have the authority. And those things cannot stay. And I've seen mass deliverances in the last six weeks that blew my mind. But the reason was because the people of God believed it. They believed it. They knew that Jesus Christ was the deliverer and I had nothing to do with it. I just brought the truth of it. And when that truth was received by the Spirit of God, God did the work. And so tonight, let's sing this chorus again. We have chairs here. We have chairs here at this front. I want you to come and fill these chairs if you feel this is what you want tonight. And then we'll have others come and stand behind you. And let's believe God. Every joint supplying the one to the other. How many believe deliverance can be wrought tonight? I believe it. 
I have no doubt in my mind <coughs> that God's going to do the work. There isn't anything He can't do, beloved. Anything He can't do. When I see murder, spirits of murder come out, spirits of violence, spirits of witchcraft, and I mean strong spirits of witchcraft. People have been inoculated. People have had things sewn under their skin. Drank potions by witch doctors. But I've seen my God take and deliver people. And I stand there and see him do it. I say, Lord, there's, there's no power like your power. No power like your power. I love him tonight. I love him because there isn't anything he can't do. There's nothing impossible with God. He can do anything. So let's sing this chorus again. And if you feel to come, I want you to come and sit here in these front chairs. And let's believe God. Hallelujah, and I want God's people to come. I want the men to stand behind the men here, and I want the women to stand behind the women. And we have a brother over here, I want a man behind him. Come on, you men that have received deliverance, I want you to come, please, and stand behind these men. You ladies that have received deliverance, I want you to come and stand behind these ladies. Now, I believe this, and I say this, this is where the Lord's trained me. You lay hands on their head only. We don't have to follow the spirits all over their body. We just have to speak the word of authority. That way it keeps everything clean and above reproach for no man or no woman will have a problem. We lay hands on the men. We lay hands on their head. Ladies, lay hands on them. Lay hands on their head. And let's believe God tonight. That God will do the work of grace in every heart and every life. I want you to begin to renounce in the name of Jesus every sin or every problem area in your life. You say, I renounce in the name of Jesus the Spirit of, and begin to name the things that you know that are bothering your life. Forget the person beside you. You do what you feel in your heart. And then when you're finished, we're going to lay hands on you and believe God to take authority over the power of Satan. Hallelujah. Now, Father, in the name of Jesus, I take authority over every principality and every power. I take authority over every demon spirit. And in the name of Jesus Christ, as the people of God begin to renounce these areas, we're asking you for the release of your power to set them free in Jesus' name. Get it out. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Breathe in now the power of God. In the name of Jesus Christ. We command these spirits of hell to loose from these hearts and lives. In the name of Jesus Christ, Satan, I bind you and I bind your power. Let you breathe in the power of God and breathe out those spirits. That's it. Get out of there in Jesus' name. In the name of Jesus Christ, come out, the spirits of hell. Come out, it. come out in Jesus' name. Get out of there. In the name of Jesus Christ, loose in Jesus' name. In the name of Jesus Christ. This is the end of this message. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are many hundreds of free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Thank you.